Oh, you know, what do you get? Um, what do you call a magician who loses his magic? Is this a dad joke? Yes, it is. <sighs> I'm not doing it. I'm not playing. What do you call a magician who loses his magic? Ross. Oh, that's not a nice thing to say about <laughs> Ross. Ross has lots of magic. Ah. <laughs> uh, Ian. Oh, you call him it? Ian. <laughs> okay, that's actually not bad. <laughs> From New York Times Opinion, I'm Michelle Cottle. I'm Ross Douthat. I'm Lydia Polgreen. And I'm Carlos Lozada. And this is Matter of Opinion. Okay, so as some of you already know, my younger kid is a rising senior in high school, which means there has been a lot of talk at our house about where to go to college. But I'm guessing um, even those of you not in this specific position have also been thinking about this subject a lot in the last few weeks. I mean, we've got the Supreme Court barring the use of affirmative action and admissions decisions. The Biden White House has opened an investigation into legacy admissions at Harvard. And now we've got this new data showing just how much elite colleges favor the extremely rich. So today I'm hoping that we can dig into the weird hold these bastions of higher learning have on the American psyche and whether or not that needs to change. Now, before we get too far into this, though, I want to get a little personal and let's just talk about where we're all coming from. So how do you all think your college experience shaped the trajectory of your life? Um, I went to a a small liberal arts college called St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland, And I will say that where I went to college had a huge impact on the course of my life because, and it has nothing to do with the education that I received, but uh, that's where I met my wife. And we've been together ever since. So, yeah, I think I went to college really mattered. I'm not sure that's exactly what people are looking for. I I also met my wife in college. And so that makes, you know, 50% of this podcast, which tells us something about the central role that college plays in the American mating market. And I assume that's just what we're going to do the episode about, right? <laughs> Carlos, can you please <laughs> tell me something besides, like, college is I a did, great dating I did, pool? I did not meet. I went to a Catholic college, so it's not. But I I did not meet. <laughs> no one no one has dated at a Catholic no college. No one gets married at Catholic college. It's like the Mormons <laughs> I at did BYU. not meet my, my wife at a Catholic college. Um, I'm a proud graduate of the University of Notre Dame. I went there for two reasons. First, my sister was already there two years ahead of me. Uh, she was the smart one. And so I figured it was good enough for Rosie. It was good enough for me. Also, the mandate was basically to go to the best Catholic school we could find uh, in America. And so for us, that was Notre Dame. And it's been a huge part of my life. You know, like not not my wife, but a lot of my closest friends are people I met there. Um, I taught for Notre Dame's Washington program, a journalism class for many years. I serve on like an advisory council at the university. I return to campus often to give talks or meet with students. So it's been kind of a, an ever-present, you know, aspect of, of my life. It wasn't easy while I was there. We sort of struggled financially, you know, I did and, and my family did to pay for it. I took out loans. I, did, I, I worked part-time. But it's a place that remains very, very kind of near to my heart. It's it's funny actually. I um um I guess after a fashion, I'm also a legacy. Although the the college that I went to is not especially selective. Um, I think over half of applicants are admitted. Selective, selective, presumably in that to apply to St. John's is to identify as a certain kind of nerd, right? Yes, and I I was. And, and remain a certain kind of nerd. Um, actually, my father went there. He only went for a year. And then it, uh, my older brother also attended the same school. Uh, and he and I were in the same year, but he started a semester after I did. So there is a bit of a bit of a family tradition. My family tradition was both parents went to Auburn because football was how I grew up. But I, I went to Vanderbilt, which at the time was not nearly as hard to get into as it is these days. And I went there in part because it was, you know, the best school in the state of Tennessee, which is where I spent much of my childhood. And it was the best school to give me money because there was no way I was paying that bill with loans or anything else. You know, my my parents obviously were super and picked up the rest, but there was just like no question that the money was what it was going to take to go there. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I just just would, would add that I was a full scholarship student. I got Pell Grants and, you know, the, the works. Um, that's how I managed to go to a small private college as well. So in other words, four private college graduates here 
Well, no one has asked me where well, I went to college. Well, well I mean, we Ross, all we all know, know where you went, I went to, to I went to a school. It's, it's, it's outside small. Boston. Ross, where did you go to college? <laughs> um, I went to Harvard. And like everyone else, I paid for part of it. But in the most embarrassing way possible, I wrote uh, spark notes. <laughs> the, the, you know, the on this is this is true confessions. Uh, the the they're basically cliff notes. And the 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 pitch was these are written by genuine Harvard undergraduates or something like that. Ross is the only one here who went to the tiny number of elite schools that usually get talked about in these discussions. And I kind of just want to know why that is. We are talking about a country where there are thousands of universities that will give you a fantastic education. You do not need to go to the top 10, God love them. Um, and yet that's all anybody ever seems to talk about. And well, I just who's, don't know. Who's understand. anybody, Michelle? Well, fine. The chattering class when you're, talk, well, well, when you're talking exactly, about these but... admissions fights in court, things like that. They're generally about what Harvard's done or Yale's done so or Stanford's two things, done. Two things can be true at the same time as usual, right? One is that these schools exert enormous influence over American life, particularly as training grounds for the elites of government and science and the private sector and culture. And it can also be true that the attention that is paid to these schools is out of proportion even to that enormous influence that they exert, in part because so many of the people in the national media and in the entertainment industries who cover and obsess over these schools themselves are products of that environment, right? Like a lot of elite journalism institutions would fall apart without their feeder from the Harvard Crimson and the Yale Daily News and the Daily Princetonian, you know? Fall um, apart or be dramatically improved. I mean, let's improved. not, you know, yeah. let's, let's not, let's um, not. You tomato, know, and think, about, think about how many movies are made set at Harvard University, right? Like Reese Witherspoon didn't go to like UVA law, right? And Legally Blonde. The you know, the, the, the obsession with these schools is very self-referential, I think. Even while acknowledging that they wield enormous influence and therefore truly matter. I totally agree. And I think that it's undoubtedly true that these um, these these schools exert an outsized um, influence on our kind of like cultural atmosphere. Um, but there's also just kind of facts, right? Like you look at the, the, the presidency. I mean, Joe Biden is the first president since Ronald Reagan to not have graduated from a uh, an Ivy League school. Um, you look at, I mean, I'm just thinking about like these extremely high prestige, lots of power, and also very exclusive. And in the case of the institution that I'm about to mention, the Supreme Court, very little accountability and um, and and sort of checks on that power, as we've been finding. I mean, the current Supreme Court, um, there are only two people on the Supreme Court who did not go to an Ivy League undergrad, and that's Amy Coney Barrett and Clarence Thomas, and only one person who didn't do an Ivy League law degree, and that's uh, Amy Coney Barrett, who I believe went to a your Notre Dame. Uh, at, at, at your alma mater. Um, and it, and yeah, you know, you look at the Supreme Court, you look at the presidency, you look at, you know, the editors of the major newspapers, you look at, you know, who gets a job as a comedy writer on Colbert or whatever. And and it's just clear that these are the pathways to the to the this is not to to disagree with you, Carlos, but I mean, it, oh, no, it, I, the struggle I, I is real. The, I said the same thing. Well, I said the that, like, they, they exert no, no, enormous influence, but our attention to them is beyond even that influence. Yeah, yeah, and the struggle is real if you think you're going to grow up to be a Supreme Court justice, which, okay, everyone has the right to believe they're going to grow up to be a Supreme Court justice. But we are ruining generations of young people, not just emotionally, but financially. I'm like, I have actually sat down with friends of my older child when they were all applying to college, and I'm like, Yes, you can like go all in and try to get yourself into Princeton or Harvard and take out loans and be paying back those loans for a billion years. And is that really worth it? And I just don't think it is for 99.9% .9 of the country. I just don't. But it isn't just the desire to be a Supreme Court justice. It's the desire to have a wider array of elite professional jobs, like, say, working for a newspaper where you comment <laughs> on on Supreme Court justices, right? I mean, so we, we I think, Michelle, in the beginning, you mentioned the new data showing the advantages for super rich applicants in getting into elite schools. And the data that that 
is taken from is work by um, an economist named Raj Chetty uh, and some others. And it's part of sort of a larger analysis of elite schools. And for a long time, there's been a lot of data showing that basically if you take two kids and they have, you know, the same GPA or the same SAT score and one of them goes to a good state university and one of them goes to an Ivy League school, their average earnings over the life cycle are going to be pretty similar. And that's the argument that you're making, right, to those kids, that basically worrying about getting into, you know, not even like Princeton or Yale, but, you know, Swarthmore and Dartmouth or something, right, as opposed to a good state school is <laughs> silly oh, because, because your talents, I just, well, I just mean, it's not just, <laughs> it's not just, you know, this is not, this is not, a, this is not. It's not like three schools, right? Yeah. My, my point is, so there's been this data for a long time saying that it doesn't make a huge difference to your earnings, where you go, you know, if kids have similar talent, similar grades and so on. And what the Chetty paper says is, yeah, it doesn't make it that big a difference to average earnings. But if you want to be in, you know, sort of elite levels of earnings, income, jobs and so on, then going to these schools does make a difference. And that's what the children of the upper middle class or their parents, right, are recognizing that there is this sort of, you know, yes, it doesn't, you will do fine wherever you go. But if you are extremely ambitious, which many people are, these schools really are sort of feeders for a particular kind of elite. And they also, just to to personalize things, I don't have quite the same feelings that, like, you talked about, Carlos, towards Notre Dame, towards Harvard itself, because I sort of feel like the institution corrupted me a little bit, right? That like I went to, I went there as an ambitious kid, obviously, but mostly it nurtured my ambitious side at the expense of um, my intellectual and moral side. And that that's sort of what these schools do. It's not just that you go there because you're ambitious. It's also that they exist to teach you that you should want to be more ambitious than than you already are in ways that is not like I don't think Harvard was good for my soul, for instance. I'm not sure going to college is supposed to be nurturing your soul, so to speak. Oh, I 100 percent disagree. Well, Lydia went to St. John's, yeah. so she <laughs> nurtured her soul. But I mean, I think I think that Ross's point is actually really a, a good one in the sense that you know, these are powerful institutions that are in the business of perpetuating their power. And so it is in Harvard's interest for its graduates to create this and 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 feed into this um, this power elite and then for their children to aspire to the same role. And it's sort of a perpetual prestige machine that just keeps kind of building and building in and of itself. Oh, I have no question why they do it. I just don't understand why the rest of us buy into it. It is an incredibly screwed up value system for almost everybody in this country to be told that you need to basically hawk your life and take out massive loans and do anything humanly possible to get to these is, places. Is everyone in this country told this? Yes. I mean, like, is every this... single person is told. It. No, it's not just Blue State America. I mean, I think what all Americans are told, not all, all Americans, but many, many Americans, is that you need to go to a four-year college, the best one you can get into, in order to be set up for adult life. That's different from what I think this narrower group, the children of the anxious upper middle class, are told, which is that you need to go to the most elite college you can get into in order to work for a big law firm, become a tenured professor, work in Silicon Valley, work for the New York Times. And those conversations overlap, but they are, I think they are different kinds of debates. With, with the added thing that those really elite schools, poor kids are not actually being asked to take out huge loans if they get into Harvard or Yale. They're, you know, often being paid for. The issue there is, like, often poor kids don't even think to apply. But the, the most elite schools are covering people. The stress is about getting in. 
Yeah. The thing that's really fascinating to me about this debate about these super elite colleges is there's so much kind of intra sort of narrow class fighting, right? Like um, you have like the very, very rich 1% up at the top. But one of the interesting findings of this new data is that of the people who apply to go to these schools, those who are most disadvantaged are actually that anxious upper middle class that right. you spoke about, right? Yes. Um, so it, there is this weird kind of intra intramural fight going on between like the top, the very, very top and the class right below it that is um, feeling extremely anxious about its ability to have access to opportunity. And that to me is the thing that's so fascinating. And then the other thing that you have is you have a group of that, that, that anxious upper middle class I think has been taught to think that the real competition for those spots is, you know, minorities and people who get other kinds of preferences. But what this new data reveals is that, like, the people who are actually hogging all these spots are the people above you on the economic on the economic. Well, no, not not necessarily. It, It shows it shows that the people above you have a big advantage for reasons connected to legacy admissions. I assume connected to the fact that. They pay full freight. They're the ones who pay yes. who pay the full yep. tag, and so schools have an incentive to have more of them. But their absolute numbers are still, you know, relatively small. Like if you're in the upper middle class, you're in competition with a larger pool of other upper middle. Like your main competition is the rest of the upper middle class numerically. That I mean, that's that that's that. Sure, but like there, you're there not wrong pers- to see your neighbor as your neighbor and your neighbor's kids that way. But I think there's also a perception that the number of slots that are available is limited by creating space for, you know, Latinos and Black people and, you know, um, LGBTQ people and, and so on. So When really what we've learned over the years is the people you should be targeting are the kids who take squash lessons and lacrosse. Yeah. And I don't know if you've, Lydia, you in particular, who, uh, you know, you travel the world significantly, if you've ever had conversations with, you know, non-Americans about the college yeah. game here. And consistently, the thing that, the, in, in my experience, that people find the weirdest is that athletes would receive an advantage mm-hmm. when applying to college. Like, that just seems absurd to a lot of people. And that says something about the role of athletics in American life, which may be very, you know, healthy in many ways. But that has always struck me as a super bizarre part of the admissions game. Now, in the just getting back for a second to the Chetty paper, what the one thing that struck me the most, and this this dovetails with what you, Ross and Lydia, were were saying earlier, is my favorite finding is that even within legacy admissions, there is a bias toward the wealthier legacy <laughs> applicants, right? Like if your parents are in the top 1% of income earners and you're a legacy, um, you're five times more likely to get in than a non-legacy applicant uh, with similar grades and test scores, right? If you're a legacy applicant, but less wealthy, you're only three times more likely to get in than the equivalent non-legacy. So there's legacies and then there's legacies. I, I mean, but it's important. I think it's just important to understand since post-affirmative action, we're clearly going to have an extended debate about legacies and athletes and those preferences, which is that on the one hand, yes, those preferences are obviously perpetuators of privilege. At the same time, they are, they're not being embraced because these schools just, you know, love the idea of, <laughs> love the idea of, of having rich kids there. It is part of the financial system. The, the way this is set up is schools want kids who, one, their parents can pay the whole price tag, which will be, you know, $100,000 a year at elite schools by the time my kids are applying to college. So you need you need kids whose parents can pay $400,000 per kid. Uh, you need some number of those. And then you want kids whose parents or the kids themselves as they grow up are more likely to donate money to the school. And I think I, I am sure that there's a correlation between being on a sports team in college and having the kind of, you know, warm feelings that Carlos has towards his alma mater and being more likely to give money. And so if you did away with legacy preference, it depends on the sports. Uh, depends Carlos, on the sports. Are, there, are there sports at Notre Dame? I, I wasn't <laughs> oh, aware. Oh, Lydia, don't get him started. Don't, as, no. a season, as a season ticket holder. No. But it's interesting, 
Ross, you're talking about the the composition of the student body beyond money even. I, you know, I think they touch on this in the study we're talking about, which is that it is to the benefit of the incoming students or seen as to the benefit that they are then rubbing shoulders and going to class with people whose parents are Supreme Court justices. So you are there to make connections at the Ivy League schools that cannot be made even one level down. And so this has churned up all these questions about, well, if you take those people out of the pool, does it actually hurt the incoming kids who need to make those connections? So it starts to get really complicated really quickly. This is an argument against um, ending legacy admissions, by the way. Just quickly, I want to say that um, people who, um, you know, uh, uh, Black alums, uh, Latino alums, they're, they're, they're saying like, oh, oh, great. Now, now you want to get rid of legacy. Exactly. <laughs> like we've had a, a couple of generations of, of, of graduates of color. And, and, and uh, so let's get rid of legacy admissions now. I think it feels kind of kind of icky. That is such a great point. It's, um, you know, it's almost like when something becomes too... When a good becomes too widespread, you know, um, you you then have greater incentives to kind of take it away. The, the other thing that I think is worth thinking about, because I think one of the things we've been circling around in this conversation is the idea like, you know, this is just this tiny group of colleges. Like, why does it exert um, outsized impact and so on and so forth? But there is also a kind of trickle down effect, right? That like the standards and practices and things like that that are set at schools like Harvard and Princeton and at the Ivy League the tier of schools that's like right below that and then the one right below that, they're all competing for the same students that um, are aspiring to go to Harvard, won't get into Harvard or do, but maybe will get less financial aid. And so you have these schools that are just like a a notch or two down that are then going to be offering generous like merit scholarships to upper middle class kids. And so it's not just students competing to go to schools, it's also schools competing for the most attractive students. And so so that it, it, it does have this distorting effect that just kind of cascades down to the whole education system that that I think is is complicated and hard to parse and hard to solve for, but I think very powerful and very real. All right, so we talked about the system we have. Let's take a quick break, and when we come back, let's talk about the system we want or whether we should just blow the whole thing up. And we're back. So given all the problems with college admissions and what we've talked about, what do you guys think? What's the better approach? Ross? <laughs> oh, I, I mean, I have a lot of plans. Like, like any good, like any good Harvard I graduate, I have, I have nothing but plans. <laughs> Best and brightest. Um, no, so one, I think, so start at the top and on the evidence we have, the Ivy League is going to be pretty hard to dislodge in that role. But ideally, you want a weaker Ivy League. You want more regional distribution of schools that feed into the elite. You want more pressure on Ivy League schools themselves to admit, for instance, larger student bodies. Ross, what I mean, do you mean when of, you say you want a weaker Ivy League? I mean that you want those schools to be poorer like fundamentally poor, they should have less money. And ideally, that would happen by graduates and alums giving less money to these schools and giving money to more deserving places. Um, But you can also make that happen by opening more large endowments to taxation, which is something that the Republican Party has already done. These schools have endowments that would allow everybody to go to school for free. I mean, that's been talked about for years. So the, the top schools don't need a penny. They could just live. So you want them first, you start by making them poorer and then you want ideally you want that to encourage and uh, there are different ways that public policy could do this sort of more alternatives to emerge that are seen as sort of their equivalent that the ambitious can apply to and for those alternatives to be more diverse in their natures. One of my pet ideas is that the next Republican president should establish a bunch of public national universities that would essentially be set up as national schools, not state schools, that are 
intended to compete with elite schools. And since this is a, a different conversation, but maybe have more political and ideological diversity within them. Um, but I think that's the ideal action at the top. More competent, more new schools starting. When you think of it's been, you know, Stanford is arguably the last big major university to be founded in the U.S., and that was 120 years ago. You want more startups. Um, and yeah, I don't know exactly how you get there, but I would start by tax <laughs> taxing Harvard and Yale a bit more. And then further down, you want more diversity in the distribution of funding for state schools and community colleges and so on. You want more experiments with two-year and one-year and vocational programs that diversify the way people think about college as a ticket to the middle class, too. But that's the other part of the equation. Which it is. I mean, setting aside the elite schools, workers with a college degree earn tens of thousands of dollars more per year than those with only a high school diploma, right? The employment rate is far lower among workers with college degrees than those without. And that's not like an elite school. That's not an Ivy Plus thing. That's just kind of like a standard thing in the population. And so you'd want, you know, whatever kind of reforms we're considering have to take into account the notion that people rightly feel that without this credential, this, this experience, they're missing out. They are left out of whatever version of the American dream we have today. But Lydia, I want you to kind of, I'm hoping you're going to back me up on this one too. We also need to spend a lot of time figuring out how different credentials can work. Like, I know it's small bore, but the skills-based hiring movement, I'm very keen totally. on. If if nothing else, as something of a signal that this is what we should be doing more of. Like, we've got states that have done this, Colorado, Maryland, Pennsylvania, the governors have done this with state hiring, kind of as a signal to the private sector that you should be looking for ways to deal with the two-thirds of American adults who don't have four-year degrees. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I, I mean, I have a, a, few, a few thoughts on this. The thing that I actually think about a lot is that the biggest category of people who I think need help are people who have started some form of higher education and not finished it, right? These are people who have student loan debt from an associate's degree or some, you know, training program or a bachelor's degree, and none of the benefit of actually having the credential. Um, so I think, like, that's an area where there could just be a huge amount of, of investment and focus, right? Like, how do we reward colleges and universities and, you know, technical and vocational institutes and things like that, that actually encourage and make it possible and have high rates of people who finish whatever it is that they start. Um, and to me, that's like a place where there's just like a very kind of obvious need for intervention, for money, for support, for, for rewarding these kinds of institutions. And one of the things that makes these Ivy League schools so great is that the vast majority of people who start actually finish and get a degree. And, you know, to me, that's like such a huge hurdle. Right. But it's reward it's reward and also punishment. Definitely. I mean, yeah. I think I think you need the challenge with all sort of student loan debt relief programs is that you don't have a mechanism for making sure that pre f functionally predatory institutions don't just exploit them to continue <laughs> not sure. graduating kids after taking their money. And this extends, I should say, to portions of the Ivy League establishment, not the undergrad programs, but like you know, the master's programs at many Ivy League schools, people graduate from them, but they are functionally predatory in the scale of the loans that they ask people to take out versus the reward. So this this happens at the elite level, too. You need a mechanism whereby institutions are held more accountable for encouraging students to take on debts unwisely and with with poor rewards. This is a type of conversation that easily, you know, reverts to and is colored by our individual experiences. And, you know, I, I was able to attend um, a, a master's program, a, a, a professional master's program at an elite school uh, because I benefited from affirmative action. I earned a master's degree in public policy from Princeton thanks to a scholarship that was aimed specifically to bringing in, you know, black and Hispanic and, and Asian kids into the, into the policy arena. I could not have afforded it otherwise. They even sent us to this like policy boot camp 
um, for the the summer before our our senior years of of college. I ended up at, at Carnegie Mellon. My roommate was uh, was a kid from um, UAB, University of, of Alabama at Birmingham. So to me, like the the affirmative action debate, I've um, in some ways I've always seen through the lens of that experience of that the very limiting lens, but to, to me very real lens of that experience. I, I mean, I had a, a, almost exactly the same experience, Carlos. You know, I wanted to have a career in journalism and uh, didn't quite know how to do it and then got accepted to Columbia University's journalism school. And for me, that was an opportunity to get access to a network. And, you know, I the, the scholarship that I received was not specifically uh, for ambitious young Black journalists, but um, who, who are we kidding? I mean, I think... But wink, you know, wink, right. Wink, yeah. wink. Like, I, I <laughs> yeah. have a pretty good idea of why they picked me in, in addition to my potential. Um, And, you know, I got to go to a very, very expensive and very prestigious and elite master's program at at basically for free and was very grateful for it. And, you know, two years later had an entry-level job as a reporter at the New York Times. So, um, it's hard to argue that <laughs> that that it didn't work, right? Like that getting access to a set of networks and people and, you know, put aside everything that I learned there and I, you know, learned some useful things. But I think the most valuable thing about that experience, and this is, you know, what makes me wary about saying like, oh, Ivy League doesn't matter. This, like it did matter. You know, I think that my path to becoming a, a reporter at the New York Times would have been quite a bit longer had I not had that experience at that specific university at that specific specific time. You know, a lot of what we're talking about and a lot of the debate about college admissions is about what we need to stop doing, right? Affirmative action is unconstitutional. Legacy admissions are unfair. But since we're talking about what to remove, I think talking about what to put into the system in a way that finds applicants who would not have necessarily considered it before could be a worthy step. And one of the proposals that you know, folks like Richard Kallenberg and others are are banding about is to just make it much you know basically do affirmative action, but on a on a class basis. If you end legacy admissions, you know you end special preferences for athletes or um, affirmative action, and simply do it on a on sort of like you know seeking out low income kids underprivileged backgrounds, regardless of race or other factors that you may in fact increase quote-unquote, diversity, even at these elite schools. Ooh, so we're, we're going to get proactive here. I would be remiss if I did not, you know, before we move to a conclusion, also bring up the big demographic shadow <laughs> hanging over the entirety of American <laughs> higher education, which complicates any kind of prescription, which is <laughs> oh, that <Ross. laughs> the entire system we have is built for a population of students that is just not going to exist in a a population size, I mean, uh, on a 15 to 20 year timescale. And part of that is because of rapidly declining birth rates. Um, So all adaptation is going to happen in a context where sort of elite schools and especially schools sort of one tier down from the elites are competing for a shrinking group of students. Um, oh my God! You're, you're, and, this is your pitch for people to have kids now, no, so I'm that not, they can no, easily no, get no, into I Harvard. Don't, I don't <laughs> know. No, no, this is where years. my self interest, you know, as a parent <laughs> of small of small children, I'm <laughs> counting on the demographic bust to make them incredible candidates <laughs> oh, for admission oh, Ross, in the year Ross, of our Lord stop. 2040. <laughs> I think we're going to we're going to have to leave it there with Ross's plea for fertility and when we come I, no, back No 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 <laughs> that only my kids only my kids are applying for college 15 years from now All righty so let's leave it there when we come back hot and cold Finally, it is time for Hot Cold, where every week one of us shares something we're into, over, or somewhere in between. So who's getting hot cold this week? Me, 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 me. I've got it. I've got it. And the me, 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 me is appropriate because it is actually a hot cold about music. Um, (laughs) I don't know about you guys, but I am, I really, really love a great cover. 
One of the biggest songs in country music right now is a cover of the song Fast Car, which was originally sung by uh, the great singer-songwriter Tracy Chapman. And a uh, country singer by the name of Luke Combs has done a, a, a cover of it. That cover is sort of riding the, the country charts and is, um, is, doing, is doing very well. But I think this is a terrible cover, and I'll tell you why. The cover does not interpret the original. It's basically a note-for-note, note, like, redo. It's like what you would expect a cover band to do. And so a lot of people are like, oh, this is disrespectful. How dare a, a white man, you know, take this song that was done by a by a Black woman, blah, 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 blah. And like, there are situations where like, that's a conversation that's worth having. But like, in this situation, absolutely not. In fact, I think it shows that this is one of the greatest songs ever written about class. I would say you could stack it against the entire songbook of Bruce Springsteen, right, as as, as songs about <laughs> what it is to be poor and working class and aspiring to a better life. And so what better to sort of prove that solidarity is real than to have, you know, a, a white country singer pick up exactly the same song and sing it in exactly the same way. But I think it's a huge failure as a cover because it brings no new original thinking to the song. Um, so that is my, I'm very hot on covers, very cold on this Luke Combs cover. I am completely with you on this. I, I'm like a huge Johnny Cash cover fan. Like nobody did a cover like Johnny Cash, whether you're talking about uh, U2's One or Nine Inch Nails Hurt. He took them and made them into something completely different. And this Luke Combs song is totally fine. I don't have a, you know, a concern about the appropriation or the offensiveness or whatever, but it's like artistically, eh, it's all right. I think the sign of a of a great cover is that the song becomes associated with a person who covered it. Um, so think about All Along the Watchtower. That's a Dylan song, but, you know, it's indelibly linked to and just, you know, absolutely linked to, to Jimi Hendrix. You know, Proud Mary, um, I Will Always Love You. I mean, Whitney Houston's interpretation of Dolly Parton's masterpiece. I mean, it's, um, it's great. The other final thing that I will say about this is I'm really happy for Tracy Chapman because hopefully a Brinks truck worth of royalties yeah is being deposited into her <laughs> bank account, and she deserves it. I was going to say, that song was out uh, the summer before I began my studies at the University of Notre Dame. And I, I remember it very, very dearly. I was kind of obsessed oh, with Tracy wow. Chapman for a while. I'll just contribute by saying that in the spirit of the episode's larger conversation, we should note that the song is not called Fast College Degree. <laughs> Just cross the border and into the city. You and I can both get Harvard degrees. Finally, finally see what it means to be living. She had to change the lyrics. She had to change that the lyrics. That was the original <laughs> lyric, I think. Now, unless I can convince one of you to do your best, Tracy Chapman. <laughs> no. no. I'm, I no. think we're going to have to leave it here, guys. You got a fast car. <laughs> I'm going to get in my fast car and go on vacation, but can't wait to see you guys when I'm back. Keep on driving, Lydia. We will see you in a few. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for joining our conversation. If you liked it, be sure to follow Matter of Opinion on your favorite podcast app. And let us know what big question we should think about next by emailing us at matteropinion at nytimes.com. Matter of Opinion is produced by Sophia Alvarez Boyd, Phoebe Lett, and Derek Arthur. It's edited by Stephanie Joyce. Our fact check team is Kate Sinclair, Mary Marge Locker, and Michelle Harris. Original music by Isaac Jones, Carol Sabaro, Sonia Herrero, and Pat McCusker. Mixing by Carol Sabaro. Audience strategy by Shannon Busta and Christina Samuluski. Our executive producer is Annie Rose Strasser. Listener.